Great to be with you this morning. I know all of you all have heard on the news the conflict that's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, we need to be thinking about the people in the country of Ukraine, but also there are some faithful congregations of the Lord's brethren that are in existence there, and they certainly need our prayers. As we are talking about the church of our Lord that we read of in the scriptures, confusion about the existence and the nature of the kingdom of Christ is not something that is new. The apostles were very confused about the nature of the kingdom. They thought that Jesus Christ was going to establish his kingdom on this earth. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they asked him, and this is after his resurrection, before his ascension to the Father, they asked him, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? One of the leading false teachers concerning the kingdom is a man by the name of Robert H. Bowl. One of our brothers, Brother H. Leo Bowles, debated him over this very subject in 1928. Most of the false notions that we hear about the kingdom today actually come from the doctrine that this man, Mr. Bowles, taught some 90 years ago. One of the great truths that's taught in the Bible is that the church was in the mind actually in the existence of God's mind from the very beginning, even before the world began, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. And plans for its establishment were developed all down throughout the ages. It was purposed, it was promised, it was prophesied, it was prepared, and finally perfected or fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. There's a lot more to this church kingdom business than first meets the eye. The veracity of God is actually at stake. Now, it is admitted by the premillennialists that Jesus Christ came to establish his kingdom on this earth. But because the Jews rejected him, he postponed the establishment of it. And instead, he established the church. Now, the error here is thinking that the establishment of the kingdom was contingent upon the Jewish consent. Yes, Jesus was rejected by his own, but the postponement of the, of the kingdom, what they think was the postponement of the kingdom, was not because of that. We're told in John 1, verse 11 and 12, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as have received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. For the eternal, eternal kingdom be postponed by God is not only an unthinkable reflection upon his deity, but it's also an absolute rejection of the prophetic word as well. And you think about that. If their prophecies were all wrong about this, then they would probably, probably be wrong about everything else. And that's unthinkable. In our scripture reading this morning, we will notice that the, if the church is not the kingdom, then Jesus Christ certainly didn't know, so, know about it because he said he was going to give to Peter the keys of the kingdom and give him the authority to use those keys. Now, keys do represent authority. And Peter used those keys on the day of Pentecost to open the doors into the church, giving the terms of entrance. Now, <clears throat> If this isn't really the case, then Peter was guilty of breaking and entering and doing that which was unlawful. There's absolutely no reason that we should ever differentiate between the church and the kingdom. They're actually the same. In fact, in our scripture reading this morning, Jesus says, The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, against the church. And he says it will never be destroyed and it will have no end. In Luke chapter 1, verse 33, the angel Gabriel said this of Jesus, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, Jesus said the church is not going to be destroyed. Gabriel said there was going to be no end to the kingdom. This is proof positive right here that the church and the kingdom are one and the same thing. The kingdom is the church, 
And it is that kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to deliver to the Father in the last day, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23 and 24. There's another statement I want to notice in Luke chapter 22, verses 29 and 30. Jesus said, And I will appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto, unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. <clears throat> this passage right here places the Lord's table in the Lord's kingdom. Now, those who partake of the Lord's Supper, they are citizens of the kingdom because that's where the table is located, it's in the kingdom. And Paul directed the church at Corinth to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, the Lord's Supper cannot be in two different locations at the same time. Therefore, we have to conclude the church and the kingdom are the same institution. Here's another statement made by Paul in Colossians 1.13. He says, Who hath delivered us from the power of Satan, or the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now he's talking to the church at Colossae, which was established around 62 AD. And he's talking to the church. And Paul said, You have been, past tense, already translated into the kingdom. That word translate means to move from one place to another. These citizens of the church were translated from the kingdom of Satan, where he is ruler of, talking about the world, and into the kingdom of Christ. They did this by obedience to the gospel of Christ, just like those on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. In John chapter 3, verse 5, another passage is quite familiar to us. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Without being born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom. That new birth is what puts you into the kingdom. And baptism is the new birth, as we see in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. And this one baptism also puts us into the church, the one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Once again, we have proof that the kingdom and the church are the same thing. They're the same institution. There's no really difference between the two, just a different description of them. The church literally means those who are called out. And the kingdom is their place of residence. Now Christ, of course, is now king and he is now reigning. Some contend that Jesus Christ is king by right, is by, uh, is by right only, but not actually king by act and fact. But Peter affirmed that Jesus Christ is exalted. He's seated on the right hand of God. He's also known as both Lord and Christ, Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 36. And all of these expressions that Peter used here are indicative of kingship. And such language would be quite inappropriate if Jesus Christ is not king either then or now. Now, Peter said that Christ was reigning, and that word was reigning is actually present tense in the Greek. So what is he reigning over? You know, the function of kingship cannot be administered until the king takes his throne and until he has actually a kingdom to rule over. To have a king without a kingdom would be totally senseless, would make any sense at all. Jesus Christ is even now the blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, 1 Timothy 6, verse 15. In fact, the name Christ actually means the anointed one. He is anointed as our king. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Now Paul talks a lot about this. This is what we know as the great resurrection chapter. He talks a lot about the end of the world. And also about Jesus himself. Notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at verses 24 through 26. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning verse 24. Paul says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. 
For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. There's a lot of things that we can learn from these three short verses. First of all, the kingdom now exists. That Christ is now reigning. That death is the enemy of all mankind. And death is the enemy of mankind at the same time that Christ is reigning. We also learn that Christ will cease to reign when death ceases to be man's enemy. And death will cease when Christ destroys it in the end, at the end of the world. At the end, when all rule and power and authority have been abolished and the kingdom is going to be surrendered to God, Jesus Christ will deliver it to the Father. Here's something else that Paul said in Ephesians 1, verses 19 through 21, that God raised Christ from the dead, made him to sit at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named. All of this language right here that we've been looking at in 1 Corinthians 15, Ephesians 1, would not make any sense. It would be ridiculous if Christ is not now king, not now reigning over his kingdom. Verses 22 and 23 of Ephesians 1, Christ was be given, given to be head over all things to the church over which he rules. Again, the church and the kingdom are the same entity. There's no distinction. But there's a doctrine being taught in a lot of religious circles today that is in total contradiction to the Bible. The so-called doctrine of the Great Tribulation, the rapture, the thousand-year reign of Christ constitutes one of the most cunningly devised fables I think ever known to mankind. And how this has been successfully pawned off on the religious world, I have no idea. But maybe we're just a society that just likes fairy tales. Now, the obvious thing about this doctrine is that no one agrees with anybody else who holds to the same doctrine. And I have discovered, after talking to some of them, they can't even agree with them themselves. One person cannot even agree with himself over the same doctrine. I have talked to some trying to figure out what this doctrine is all about and see if anybody could make sense of it. And every time I talk to somebody, they end up contradicting themselves several times in the explanation. And this is a common thing with the false doctrine, because truth doesn't contradict itself. And this is far from the truth. So let's try to kind of understand some of the doctrines that they support in this thing called premillennialism. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I want to begin talking about the great tribulation that they speak of. Now, Jesus did speak of a great tribulation that was going to take place in Matthew 24, verse 21. He says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now, to apply this statement to premillennial doctrine, is you have to do it by taking it out of context, and that's exactly what these people have done. The tribulation, according to the the premillennialists, ushers in the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus Christ. But taking these things out of context, of course, is going to present even greater problems. For example, in verse 16, it says that the disciples were to flee to the mountains. But since these disciples, according to the premillennial doctrine, have already been caught up with Jesus Christ and they're in the air with Christ during this great tribulation, there's not going to be any disciples to flee to the mountains. What sense would it be for them to pray that it wouldn't be on the Sabbath day if this is going to be the end of the world? J. Marcellus Kick said this, he says the nature of it would be such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. However, he says, if it denoted a future event ushering in the end of the world, it would hardly be necessary for Christ to add the phrase, nor ever shall be. That tribulation would automatically end all tribulations. That's true. Considering the physical, moral, and religious aspects of this horrible happening in history, 
One may safely say that the Jews have never experienced such a tribulation even up to this day. And he says, we must remember that Jesus is speaking about a tribulation to be experienced only by the Jewish nation. And that's exactly who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to the Jews, talking about the destruction of their temple. He's talking to the Jewish nation. You also need to kind of take notice of verse 36 here in Matthew 24. This is what is called a transition verse. He quits talking about the destruction of the temple, and now he's talking about the end of the world. In fact, I want you to notice what verse 34 says. It's a key verse. It says, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled, all the things previous to that verse, which includes the great tribulation in verse 21. What about that word rapture? You can search from one end of the Bible to the other, and you're not going to find the word or even the concept of the word rapture. Delton Hahn, who was a faithful member of the Lord's Church, wrote a lot of religious tracts. He said this in his tract, is there going to be a rapture? He says the premillennial idea of the rapture doesn't mean just the lifting up of the saints to meet Christ in the air at the end of the world. It means the secret catching away of the church, the resurrected and living saints who will rise from the earth to meet the Lord who has secretly appeared in the air just before the beginning of a great tribulation period on earth. He says the tribulation period is to last seven years, this is according to their doctrine, at the beginning of which the literal Jews shall have returned to their land in unbelief and at which time they have either rebuilt the temple or in the process of rebuilding it. In unbelief of Christ, they will enter into a seven-year agreement with the Antichrist. After three and a half years, the true nature of the Antichrist will be revealed. He will stop the daily sacrifice which has resumed and have his own image set up in the holy place. The devil and his angels are then cast into the earth. I don't know where they're at this time. They'll be cast into the earth having great wrath because their time is short. During the final three and one half years, Jerusalem is to be trodden underfoot. A third of the Jews are to assemble in Jerusalem. The nations are to unite against the city and overcome it. Great suffering is to be inflicted on the inhabitants and half of them are to be carried into captivity. Those remaining are to turn to Christ. They're going to be converted. Now, the rapture theory requires Christ coming in two stages. So if you think about the rapture theory, they've actually got Christ coming back three times, which the Bible speaks nothing of. He came once in the flesh. He's going to come again at the end of the world. We only know of two comings in the scriptures. And yet this premillennial idea has him coming back three times. Now, he first comes for his saints, according to this, in this uh, rapture theory. He's going to come first for his saints, and then he comes with his saints the second time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 through 17 is said to be the first coming. Jude, verses 14 and 15, where it says he comes with 10,000 of his saints, is to be the second coming. The first coming has the saints meeting the Lord in the air to be with him for seven years while that great tribulation takes place on the earth. The second coming after the tribulation begins the millennial reign and after this the great judgment. The problem with this this is that Jude himself says that the ungodly will be judged when Christ come and they say this is the second coming. But the theory has the judgment of the ungodly after the millennial reign, which makes it 1,000 years too late. So the rapture has become a big rupture in the mind of the millennial man. They say the first coming is described by the Greek word parousia, or presence, sometimes translated like that. The second coming is going to be according to the Greek word epiphania, which also would be sometimes translated as manifestation. Let's take our Bibles now. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. There's a careful study that, you know, you need to do because the 
Premillennialists like to say that the word parousia and epiphania describe two separate comings. That's where they get all this from, this, the three comings of Christ. But I want you to notice here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, when you look at a study of these Greek words, you will find that there is no justification for two separate comings. Notice what he says, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That word brightness here in the King James verse or version is the word epiphania. Coming, that word coming is the Greek word parousia. Both in the same verse, both speaking of the same event. And yet they want to try to divide these different comings up because of these two words. Well, it just doesn't make sense, and they cannot prove their point. So now let's look at Paul's thousand-year reign. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15 again. And let's look at verses 23 through 26. We're not going to read them, but there's a number of things in this text in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 26 that make this millennial reign absolutely impossible. First of all, verse 23, the resurrection of all the dead are going to take, time, take place during the time of the parousia. And that word there, coming, is that word parousia. But you know, when you look at the scriptures, there's provision for only one resurrection in the Bible and even according to their theory. Secondly, the end happens at the same time as the parousia, which leaves no room for a thousand-year reign. Third, at the parousia of Christ, the already existing kingdom is going to be delivered to the Father. That's verse 24. And then in verse 25, it says, he must reign till. That tells you he is already, he is reigning now. And then also that word till refers to a point when the reign of Christ will end and death is destroyed, but not the beginning of a thousand year reign. So Paul has actually sounded the death knell to this idea of a thousand year reign on this earth. That is a fable that has been conjured up in man's own mind. It is not found anywhere in the scriptures. The kingdom is the church, and it is in existence now. Christ has now been crowned king. He is now reigning seated on the right hand of God, ruling from on high. The rapture, the tribulation, that dual coming, the thousand-year reign, all these things that are they're related to this premillennial doctrine are all false ideas, and they need to be rejected. The rapture theory actually gives the false hope of a second chance. They're saying that when Christ raptures the saints up into the air for that seven-year period, well, then those that are left that are not right with God, they have another chance to get it right. The Bible doesn't make mention of any such thing. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 44, the Bible says, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such time as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Jesus is telling us, you need to be ready now. Because when he comes again, you're not going to have time to repent. You're not going to have time to obey the gospel. And he's going to come in the twinkling of an eye as fast as you can blink your eyes. There will be no time to make things right. You have to make things right now. So be ready. Obey the gospel. And if you haven't obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do so. If you're a believer in Christ, are you willing to confess him, repent of your sins, and to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. If you, do, if you are and willing to, this is how you contact the blood of Jesus Christ, to have your sins thus washed away so you can walk in newness of life. It's the only way we can have a chance of, of heaven. And that's just the beginning. If you are a child of God, you have obeyed the gospel, have you been a faithful member of the kingdom, kingdom of Christ? Have you been walking according to his laws, doing what he has said? If not, and there's something you need to do that you haven't been doing, let's change. 
If you need to stop doing something that you're doing, let's make that change. And you have the opportunity now. Which op next opportunity, we don't know if we'll ever get. If there's anything that we can help you with, whatever it may be, to get your life right with God so you can have a hope of eternal life in heaven with, with him forever, then we encourage you to take the opportunity. Once you come, plot together and sing. We stand and sing.